This is lecture 13 in Principles of Metabolism. And um, in this lecture, we'll look at actually measuring metabolites, and some methods for doing that. So one complicated thing with working in metabolism is that measuring metabolites is actually really hard. Uh, in some uh, fields of molecular biology, you deal with very sort of uniform molecules, like in um, if you work with RNA or DNA sequencing, things like that. Uh, all the kind of nucleic acids are chemically the same. They change in sequence, but they're always the same kind of chemically. Metabolites are not like that. So we have a wide variety of different types of chemical species with very different chemical properties. So they range in, in size and in uh, charge and in uh, hydrophobicity and things like that. So you can, in the same sample, be interested in, in things like glycine, which is very small and polar. Uh, you might be interested in fatty species like palmitate fatty acids, uh, highly charged things, phosphate groups. So, and these all behave very differently when you try to measure them. Measure them. So this is a fundamental problem, really. And um, at the same time, accurate measurements are of course fundamental. We have looked at some things like measuring uptake, release fluxes, trying to do flux analysis based on isotopes, isotopomers. And in order to do anything of this, we have to be able to measure metabolites in an accurate way first. So how do we do that? So let's start at the beginning. You have um, a sample. Say you have a cell extract or you have a tissue extract or plasma or something. And step one is really to get the metabolites out. And this is called metabolite extraction. Uh, and uh, there's... This is a fairly simple process, but you have to think a little bit because there are caveats already here. Uh, usually, you you grind up tissue or stuff like that if you have to do if you have a more sort of tough sample. Uh, if you have cells, you can just lyse them, stuff like that. But uh, then you have to do an extraction somehow, so you have to get the metabolites in solution. Uh, and for this, you have to choose a solvent. Uh, so if you have polar metabolites you're interested in, you will need a polar solvent. Uh, so there's a couple of, of choices there. Uh, you have to be aware of things that metabolites could degrade. Uh, there are things that don't uh, live well in oxygen, for example. So reduced metabolites could spontaneously oxidize. So you could lose them already before you have started your measurement. Some metabolites are volatile, so they might just escape uh, from solution. And there's always enzymes around when you're dealing with living, living matter, so you have to inactivate those in some way. So usually this is done by either boiling or by very rapidly freezing the sample or cooling it very rapidly uh, so that you inactivate the enzymes. Uh, and all these problems have their uh, solutions, but it's something you have to think about in advance if you're interested in particular species of metabolite. So there are some issues already here. Now, having gotten your metabolites into a nice solution, uh, you are faced with the basic problems of analytical chemistry. So you now have a complex solution with lots and lots of species in them that came from your cells uh, with your measuring. Uh, and you're probably interested in some of them and not in the others. So there are a few things we need to do. We need to separate these somehow. So how, somehow we have to be able to tease these apart and focus on the ones you're interested in. And then you have an identification problem. So you have to be able to prove somehow that whatever signal you're getting out of your measurement instrument, that it actually derives from the metabolite you're interested in and not something else that might be very similar and somehow masquerading as the metabolite you're interested in. So this has to be proven somehow. Usually this is done from some kind of pure standard. But it's not always easy. And then there's the quantification problem. So um, often we are happy with relative amounts to be able to have something which is proportional uh, to the amount that you're interested in. So you can do things like fold changes between samples, but sometimes you want absolute quantification. Uh, and if that's the case, then you're in for a bit of a more challenge because you have to do uh, standard curves and think about saturation problems and stuff like that. But these are the basic problems we deal with in all the uh, measurement methods that we will look at. Separation, identification, and quantification. So somehow we have to tackle these problems of analytical chemistry. And um, there are a few 
different methods for doing it. Um, and the simplest or in some ways most accessible method that probably most people have seen in some way or probably done uh, is some form of enzymatic assay. Uh, so this is the kits that you can buy from Sigma or other companies uh, that are kind of just optimized for measuring one specific metabolite that you're interested in and quantifying that. So this is kind of clever really. So we are solving the identification separation problem by using enzymes. So we are taking advantage of the fact that enzymes are fairly specific. They act on a specific substrate. So if you can find uh, an enzyme that has as its substrate the uh, metabolite that you're interested in, then you might be able to come up with a way of exploiting that uh, to figuring out how much of that metabolite you have in your, in your complex solution. So what is done uh, is that you have to figure out some way usually of coupling the activity of this enzyme that accepts your, your metabolite of interest to some type of reaction step where you can generate another metabolite, let's call it a reporter metabolite, which is easy to measure. And easy to measure means that maybe you can generate something that is detectable immediately in a spectrophotometer or something like that. If you're really lucky, the actual metabolite you're interested in is already detectable in a spectrophotometer or something like that. But usually you have to couple it. Um, so these can be different things. There are these kind of probes that fluorescence, that are fluorescent at particular wavelengths when they oxidize. Um, NADH is a very common uh, reporter metabolized because this can be measured by absorbance. Um, so something like that has to be uh, constructed and there's tons of papers in biochemistry uh, that devise different methods using specific enzymes and pathways uh, to do this for different metabolites. And you can buy these as kits and they're already sort of optimized and so on. Um, so practically what you do is that you have to find a pure enzyme um, and uh, it's usually added in excess so that the only thing that's really influencing how much of your reporter you get is the amount of metabolite you have. Um, the reactions are run to completion so that you don't have any dynamics to worry about or something like that. So that in the end the reporter metabolite is really in proportion to your metabolite of interest. And if you want to do absolute quantification with this type of kits, you run some type of scan standard curve uh, using the metabolite that you're interested in. So um, all in all, it sounds pretty simple, but it, it can get tricky, complicated, because there are caveats with all of these things. So one of the major problems uh, is that enzymes are not always really specific. They can react with other things than the uh, metabolite you're interested in, and when you have a complex mixture, you can never be 100% sure that you actually got a reaction from the substrate you wanted. And if you have complicated kits with many different enzymes and enzymatic steps that are put together, then these uh, assumptions sort of compound each other and it becomes more and more sort of uncertain. Now, some kits are better than others because the enzymes used are more specific than others. Unfortunately, they're usually hard to troubleshoot and difficult to sort of tell if they're actually working correctly if you buy them in this type of closed form as a kit because you don't really know what's in what's in the uh, the reaction mixture so all this information is proprietary. Uh, you can make your own kits from the biochemistry then you have a better shot of, of, of understanding things. Uh, but anyway th there are hidden assumptions in here. The other classic method of separating metabolites is chromatography uh, which I'm sure you have seen in one form or another. So this is separation by chemical properties. So here you are taking your, your complex mixture of, of metabolites and you are running them uh, over time through some type of column which is packed with some type of material that interacts with your metabolites. Uh, and this slows down some metabolites more than others. So depending on some chemical property, say how charged it is or, or how much uh, amine groups it has, uh, it will come out at a particular retention time. Uh, so uh, in this case you might have your metabolite of interest somewhere in the middle and it will generate a peak if you are you hook this up to some kind of detector that detects the amounts that come out uh, and then you can uh, quantify the metabolite uh, by looking at the area of the peak that represents the amount of material that come out of the column 
Uh, and uh, to identify things, you have to look at some kind of pure standard, run this through the column and see that your pure standard actually runs out at the same time as your, your compound of interest. So it's pretty basic stuff. But um, this is problematic in many ways. There is no really no proof that you have your actual compound just because it coincides with your, um, uh, with your standard. So you might run a standard for glutamate in this case, and the standard might show up here, and when you run a cell extract or something, then you might also get a peak there, and it's, you know, it's pretty good. But you can't really be 100% sure that there isn't something else that has a very similar retention time and shows up instead. So uh, there's no proof for this. Um, and then um, based on peak areas, you can do absolute quantification as before by running standard curves of pure standards. Um, but these has some, some problems because you, it's sometimes hard to run standard curves in buffer and then compare it to a complex sample. Uh, the properties of the mixtures are different and the peak areas might change and the peaks might drift and stuff like that. Uh, so there's a whole, uh, whole science really in trying to figure out uh, chromatography methods. And there's really a zoo of different ways of constructing chromatography methods. And a lot of it is trial and error. There's sometimes hard to find the principles behind this. It's uh, just sometimes specific combinations of, of solutes and solid phases and pH and temperature and whatnot happens to work. So it's a bit empirical. Um, what's uh, usually important in chromatography methods is pressure. So if you have high pressure, you tend to get nicer peaks that are uh, better defined in chromatography. So you usually see a sequence of chromatography and high pressure chromatography and ultra high pressure chromatography. Uh, so it's, um, that is one thing that's clear that pressure is an important determinant. So that's chromatographic methods. And then we get to uh, mass spectrometry. And um, this is a way, again, of separating metabolites. And in this case, by, we separate them by their mass charge ratio. We usually say that we separate things by mass. But to be precise, all mass spectrometry works with the ratio between the mass and the charge of a metabolite. And that's because uh, mass spectrometry deals with ions. So in mass spectrometry, we always have to first get our sample uh, into an ionized form. So we have to get them in gas form. Um, and and, and th this is because we need to accelerate uh, these to uh, hit the detector to look at mass charge. Uh, so these go into vacuum. So you form some ions from your the molecules, the metabolites in your sample. They are accelerated in a vacuum tube of sorts. Uh, and then there's some kind of detector that can measure the mass charge ratio. So this is um, associated with some problems. Um, already at the ionization step, there's plenty of metabolites that sort of don't ionize well. People sometimes talk about how well things fly. Uh, so if your metabolites don't take flight, then they're not going to show up at all. So there are definitely some metabolites that are different, uh, difficult to work with uh, with this measure. So there are some, some false uh, negatives because of that. Um, and um, then you have to uh, usually run things in either positive or negative mode. It depends on the metabolite, uh, which, which uh, polarity is, is useful because not all metabolites will form positive ions and negative ions, just one or the other. Um, so there are some, some assumptions there or some, some limitations. But at the end of the day, what you get is you get an ion current of some kind in your detector and that reflects the relative abundance. The, um, there's been a, a sort of rapid development of mass spectrometry over the past couple of decades, and the instruments that we have now are very accurate. Um, so kind of older generations can separate things that differ by a proton, by one Dalton. Uh, the modern methods are down to thousands of a Dalton, so they are very accurate in mass. Uh, and we will see why that is important in a minute. There is really a, a very large variety of ionization methods, so how you get the metabolites into, into the ion form, uh, and a lot of different detection methods. So this is a bit of a jungle. 
uh, but um, common methods in, in metabolism is orbit trap methods, which are a, a form of accurate mass uh, methods, and the time of flight uh, mass spectrometry. So these you will see a lot when you look at, uh, at metabolic papers. So we mentioned that it's good to have high mass accuracy and that modern mass spectrometers have, have high mass accuracy. So what is this good for? Well, it helps actually to separate some molecules to have really good mass accuracy. So there are always some cases in, in metabolism, in your measurements, where you see um, cases where different metabolites uh, with different structure could have exactly the same sum formula. And then they will have exactly the same mass charge ratio. It's just the same sort of isomer of the same thing. Uh, and these we will never be able to separate by mass spectrometry. You will need something else for that. But then there are also cases where you have something which is different in, in some formula, actually. So there's not the same composition of things, in addition to having a different structure, uh, but which ends up being very close uh, in mass to the one you're interested in. And uh, there's a lot of these type of examples, actually. And so having a very good mass accuracy helps to separate these uh, species apart. And that really helps to clean up your signal and making sure that you don't get your glutamate uh, mixed up with something else that actually has a different mass. So, so here, high mass accuracy helps to separate metabolites from each other. It can also be very helpful when you run isotope tracing because um, when you add isotopes to the mix, you get even more peaks. Uh, one single metabolite gives lots of different peaks for different uh, mass isotopomers. Um, so now you have even more uh, masses in your, in your mass spectrometry. Uh, and that means that it's really good to have high mass accuracy to make sure you separate all of them. Uh, there's also the case that Sometimes when you want to look at isotopes in different uh, elements, in different types of atoms, like 13C and 15N, they actually differ a little bit. So if you would label a molecule at the carbon uh, over here, for example, that is, gives you a bit of a different mass. It, we call it plus one, but it gives you something that's actually a little bit different from one. And if you would label the nitrogen, you get something again which is a little bit different, a little bit less than one. Uh, so you can actually tell what type of isotope has been labeled uh, if you have enough mass accuracy. And this is helpful in some ways because if you want to study, for example, nitrogen uh, isotopes and nitrogen metabolism, uh, there is always going to be natural carbon isotopes uh, in your mixture because 13C exists in nature. And if you don't have enough, enough mass accuracy, you're not going to be able to separate them out. So there are things like that also that... that uh, high mass accuracy really helps solve. So this is one reason why this is important. And then you can combine mass spectrometry with chromatography. This is a very popular method. So you see these type of abbreviations, LCMS, so liquid chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry, GCMS, which is gas chromatography coupled to mass spectrometry. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're using your chromatography method, putting your sample into that, uh, and then you're hooking this up to a mass spectrometer so that whatever comes out of the column is ionized uh, and shot into the mass spectrometer. And then you have your detector uh, usually scanning some mass interval or sometimes looking at specific masses you're interested in and doing this over time. So cycling and repeating and continuing to look at these masses. So what you get in the end is you get a kind of two-dimensional data sort of two axes of separation. Uh, and what is shown here on the right is an example from, from our lab on a, on a thermo QX active instrument. Uh, so this is an orbit trap type of mass spectrometer with fairly high mass accuracy. Uh, so you can see the retention time on one end. So this reflects when the metabolites elute from the column. Uh, and then at each retention time, you have a scan of all the masses in the, in the mass uh, spectrometer in the detector. And here we, I have just highlighted with a dot every peak that we detect uh, in these samples. And so you see a lot of things come out and they are separated in both dimensions. You have two axes of separation sort of. Uh, so things can be separated well sometimes on the mass 
uh, axis, even though they don't, they all elute at the same time. Uh, and then you have cases where you have a lot of things in the same sort of mass region, but you can separate them by chromatography. So this is very helpful. It, it gives you better separation, really. And if you look at a particular mass, then you can often you see these drawn as chromatograms. You hardly see this type of 2D representation. It's just too much data to look at at the same time. Uh, but if you look at a particular mass, you can view the chromatograms again uh, for things at that particular mass. Then. And then you can use uh, areas of peaks in the same way as you do with chromatography uh, to quantify whatever was eluting at that particular time and mass. So um, this is quite powerful, um, but we should keep in mind that it inherits both the pros and the cons from, from chromatography and mass spectrometry. So you have all the complexities of chromatography in here as well, uh, how to set up those methods and buffers and pH and whatnot. Uh, and uh, of course you have the issues with mass spectrometry that not everything ionizes and, and so on. But all in all this is a, a quite powerful method and because mass spectrometers are also quite sensitive, uh, this tends to be a, a quite sensitive method of analyzing uh, metabolites. And you can get quite a lot of data from a single run, which is also good and bad. It's great to have a lot of metabolites detected, uh, but also generates large data files and there's a usually a complex processing step. You have to do a bit of bioinformatics to get all the data out. And that actually takes quite a bit of time working with this type of data sets, uh, just to, to analyze the numbers as they come out. But all in all, this is a really powerful method and um, used a lot in, in metabolism, I would say. And then finally, I will just say a couple of words about uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, or NMR spectroscopy. I'm really not an expert in this, so this is very uh, basic and cursory. Um, but essentially what NMR does is a different principle. It can separate compounds by looking at electromagnetic properties in their nuclei, so something called a sh chemical shift, which has to do with, with uh, how the um, atoms are bonded to each other and how they sort of resonate. Um, so this separates things a little differently than uh, mass spectrometry. Um, it has to do a bit with which, what kind of functional groups you have in the molecules, kind of the structure. Uh, so you can get a little bit of structural information in a way. Uh, but essentially this is a, a different physical sort of method for separating compounds. Um, a good thing with NMR is that you can measure the sampling more or less directly. Um, so you don't have to go through ionization and uh, all these kind of preparatory steps that can introduce problems. And because of that, it's usually a good quantitative method. Uh, it's, it's a good method if, if you have your, your metabolite well isolated and detected on NMR. It's a good way to do absolute quantitation studies. The basic problem with NMR is that it tends to have low sensitivity compared to mass spectrometry, at least. Uh, so there are often a lot of things that you cannot see on NMR because they're just too low abundance. Um, but basically, this is a, uh, an orthogonal method, a complementary way of measuring metabolites. In NMR, you can also do some um, uh, quantification of isotopes, uh, and it's used for that quite a bit. And uh, this is a bit interesting because since the um, NMR method works with this chemical shift property, and the chemical shift has to do with how atoms are bonded together, it means that you can get some type of positional information. You can get some idea of where in the molecule the actual isotopes are. So you remember what we have said with mass spectrometry is that since we only measure mass, we get these mass isotopomers, and we have no clue where anything sits. Um, in NMR, you can get at least partial information. So for example, if you have two uh, carbon 13s next to each other in a molecule, they will interact in a way so that in the NMR spectrum, a single peak will split into two peaks. So you will be able to distinguish this particular case from that one. Uh, and there's some rules for this, it's a bit complicated, but if you work it out, you can get some type of positional information. And you usually don't have the full structure, you don't know exactly uh, where all the carbon-13s are, but you can say something about it. 
Uh, a problem, though, with using NMR for um, for isotope information is that it's, by by principle it doesn't detect the unlabeled atoms. Uh, so this is a method known as 13C NMR. So it's based on the actual properties of the 13C atoms. And so if you have completely unlabeled species, they will never show up to begin with. Uh, so that means that you don't get complete MIDs in this case. Uh, you don't get the full distribution of all the isotopomers. You get some of them and their relative proportions. So some pros and cons, but it's a nice complementary method to mass spectrometry. And the data I'm showing on this slide is from this particular uh, paper by Ralph Berdini's group. It's a really nice paper looking at uh, isotope tracing of, of glucose in brain tumors. So um, those are the methods I will uh, talk about when it comes to uh, measuring metabolites. And as you can see, it's a bit of a complex topic, uh, but the analytical methods have really progressed in the last decade or so, and uh, we now really have good powerful methods that can measure a lot of things.